5. The Battle of Uhud, 625 AD. The people of Mecca were outraged at the massacre and the subsequent mutilation of their kinsmen in the Battle of Badr by Muhammad and his army. They had to fight back in order to defend themselves, so they gathered up an army and set out on the march to Medina. Muhammad set out with his motley crew of hundreds of pirates of the desert. When Muhammad tried forcing the Jews of Medina to join him, they adamantly refused, knowing fully well the true character of the tyrant. Muhammad and his men camped on the slopes of Mount Uhud above the camp of the Meccan army. With his usual insidious manner, Muhammad planned to attack before dawn as the Meccans were asleep. The Muslims were too incompetent to implement even this plan properly and ended up alerting the Meccans during the surprise attack. At this point, the Meccans gathered up their weapons and engaged the Muslims in full combat. Muhammad, as usual, cowered in the background, surrounded by his bunch of bodyguards. From time to time, he would scream out, Who will become a martyr for Allah? And which of you will sell himself for us? Exhorting his army with promises of paradise if they fought for him. The Muslims, this time, however, were no match for the Meccans. Most of them started running for their lives by clambering up the sides of Mount Uhud, at which Muhammad started swearing like a madman. It was only by a stroke of good luck that Muhammad survived. His army was badly defeated, and the people of Medina started asking that if this man was indeed a messenger of Allah, then why had Allah not given the Muslims victory? To make up for the extreme embarrassment of this defeat, Muhammad came up with more divine revelations that were obviously excuses for the thorough thrashing that his men and ego had suffered at Uhud. Muhammad was so obsessed with his own sense of self-importance that he made any action that went against his power a crime. Any Muslim who did not treat Muhammad like Allah would be punished severely. The third chapter of the Quran is full of these references to the Battle of Uhud. Al-Imran 3.140 And if ye have received a blow, the disbelievers have received a blow the like thereof. These are the vicissitudes which we cause to follow one another for mankind, to the end that Allah may know those who believe and may choose witnesses from among you. Here, Muhammad's Allah is conveniently making excuses for the severe defeat of the Muslims by saying that although they suffered huge losses, the Meccans also suffered losses. In addition to this, Allah conveniently bails out Muhammad yet again by explaining away the total decimation of the Muslim army with the excuse that it was a trial for the Muslims. This surah also makes very clear the reason why Muslims everywhere bring nothing but death and destruction. The Allah of Islam is instructing his followers to prove their loyalty by going out and killing unbelievers, therefore legalizing murder and giving it divine sanction. And who are those unbelievers? Any innocent person who does not agree to Muhammad's twisted version of Islam. A belief system based upon such principles can only be embraced by people of the most inhumane, cruel, and barbarous nature. Al-Imran 3.153 When you climb the hill and paid no heed while the messenger in your rear was calling you to fight, therefore he rewarded your grief for his grief. Here Muhammad is lashing out at the followers who dished him and ran up Mount Uhud for their lives. His ego is so deluded that in this surah, he tells his followers that deserting the messenger is the same as deserting Allah. Muhammad, the slave of Allah, is thus equating himself with the supreme power itself. This is in reality one of the most despicable forms of blackmail that Muhammad used upon his followers. In short, they were told that anyone who doesn't protect Muhammad with his life will be punished by Allah in the form of his family and tribesmen being killed by divine will. 6. Murder of a Poet Among the Jewish tribe of Bani Nadir was an eminent poet by the name of Ka'b ibn al-Ashraf. He was an extremely famous and cultured poet who was considered a genius of verse. He had composed a lament about the Quraishites who had been so unjustly massacred and mutilated in the Battle of Badr. One day, Muhammad proclaimed in his usual sweet manner, Who will rid me of the dog Ka'b ibn al-Ashraf? A certain Muhammad bin Maslama replied that he would do it, adding, we shall have to tell lies to do it. 
inevitably Muhammad immediately gave the divine authority to lie as necessary. Needless to say, as usual, after dark, Kaab was dragged out of his bed screaming and stabbed repeatedly by Muhammad Maslama and three other devout Muslims in full view of his young wife-to-be. Muhammadan Islam triumphs once again. 7. Invasion of Beni Nadir, June 625 AD. The Jewish tribe of Beni Nadir was outraged at the assassination of the greatest poet, Kaab ibn al-Ashraf. The fact that one of the greatest literary figures of their tribe had been mercilessly murdered simply because he wrote some words that criticized Muhammad was a cause of immense rage. The sight of the wealth possessed by the Bani Nadir whipped up a frenzy of jealousy inside Muhammad. Using his usual methodology of subterfuge and deception, Muhammad claimed that Allah had revealed to him that the Bani Nadir were hatching a plot to assassinate him. The Nadir were amazed when out of the blue, a Muslim messenger arrived at their oasis with the message from Muhammad. The message was worded in the usual brutal manner. Leave my city and live here no longer after the treason which you have plotted against me. The Nadir, being mere civilians, decided the best thing to do was to shut themselves up in their homes and prepare to defend themselves. Immediately, Muhammad surrounded them with his army of murderers and sat down outside, protected by his usual bunch of bodyguards. When the Nadir made no move to fight, the merciful Muhammad started cutting down every single palm tree in the oasis. Ladies and gentlemen, please remember that in a desert environment like Arabia, this act was equivalent to mass murder, considering how hard it was to grow food. The Nadir could not bear to see their oasis destroyed so mercilessly and came out to surrender. Muhammad, who was still cowering behind his bodyguards, screamed out, Leave this place, you have your lives. The peace-loving tribe, which had carefully tended their land and made it the oasis that it was, after centuries of hard work, were thrown out at sword point and stripped of all their belongings. They had to flee for their lives to Khaybar, another Jewish settlement, which in a future course would also be destroyed by the Apostle of Peace. All the rich booty and the land was grabbed by the plundering Muslims, but the largest amount of land and most of the loot went, as always, to the epitome of fair play and justice, Muhammad. As usual, a torrent of made-to-order divine revelations followed. Al-Hashr 59.2 He it is who hath caused those of the people of Scripture, Jews, who disbelieved to go forth from their homes unto the first exile. You deemed not that they should go forth, while they deemed that their strongholds would protect them from Allah. That is because they were opposed to Allah and His Messenger. Whatsoever palm trees you cut down or left standing on their roots, it was by Allah's leave, in order that he might confound the evil livers. Once again, the most compassionate and merciful Allah comes to Muhammad's rescue and declares that all the crimes and atrocities that were committed against the innocent Bani Nadir were justified by the divine word of the all-merciful Allah. Not only that, but Allah decrees that the Jews deserved to be thrown out of their homeland simply because 1. They were not Muslim 2. They were opposed to Muhammad The fact that he mercilessly assassinated their innocent poet for daring to criticize him is ignored 3. They were on prime land and had a huge amount of wealth which Muhammad lusted for Over and above this, cutting down palm trees was considered a capital crime by the Arabs so Muhammad had to have Allah give him a nice and tidy excuse for having committed this atrocity. Lastly, Muhammad is making it very clear here as to who is the boss. If anyone opposed Muhammad, it meant he opposed Allah and all Muslims had to kill anyone who opposed Allah. So the final equation remained the same. Muhammad and Allah are on the same footing. Again, we have come a full circle to the fundamental and central guiding principles of Muhammadan Islam, intolerance, hatred, murder, and brutality.